Hello everyone. Today I'll describe the process I went through to build this garage from a kit I purchased online. With the exception of the foundation, I did all of the work with some friends and family. Don't watch this as a tutorial though because none of us are trained professionals in this. Instead, consider this video to be a showcase of all of the challenges and costs associated with building one of these garages yourself instead of hiring contractors. Spoiler alert, it's really, really hard, but at the end of the day, you're probably going to save a lot of money going down this route. In the description, you'll find a list of chapters and sections. And with that, let's start the video. First off, if you plan on building one of these yourself, you should be comfortable with working high up off the ground, and you should be prepared to rent some scaffolding and a tall ladder if you don't have one lying around already. It also goes without saying that you'll need an assortment of power tools. You will also need some friends to come and help you. Speaking of which, I want to thank Chase for all of his help with the roof, framing, and for letting me use his tools. I also want to thank my wife Amber for doing all of the painting, Tom and Brandon for helping me with the roof sheathing, and my nephew Edda for helping with the gable walls. The garage kit I chose is the Best Barns West Virginia with the 16 by 20 footprint size. Uh, this garage is available as a kit on shedsdirect.com. The price while I was recording this segment was around $10,000, but back when we purchased it about a year ago, it was closer to $9,200. I'll include a link in the description as well as a link to the building instructions document that's published by this manufacturer. Uh, Home Depot also sells these kits, although they charge a higher price. And it's also worth mentioning that there are bigger sizes available. The 16 by 20 is the smallest. I think you can go as big as 16 by 32. The next big purchase was the concrete foundation, which ended up costing $7,800, including the labor to pour it. Um, note that with this garage kit, the foundation is not included and using a concrete foundation is optional. You can save a lot of money by using a wooden foundation instead, but you'll miss out on a lot of the durability and functionality, which comes with using a concrete foundation for this type of building. The roofing materials are also not included in the kit, so you have some freedom to choose what you want. In total, the roofing materials cost around $2,000 for me. I used metal roofing panels and trim pieces from Union Corrugated. These can be supplied by Lowe's, I think maybe Home Depot under a different brand name. But keep in mind that you can also use asphalt shingles or panels to save some money here. And also note that very often uh, the trim pieces are not in stock or they're in stock in the wrong color. So you might have to get a little bit creative with buying pieces from alternative manufacturers. Or if you're feeling a little bit adventurous, you could also repaint some pieces which are the wrong color. I actually ended up doing this with some of the rake trim on this build, and you can't even tell that it's a different color. Uh, but I'll get to that in, in a later part of the video. Finally, uh, you want to add about $2,000 for odds and ends. Uh, for me, this includes the cost of doors, paint, windows, garage door, those sort of things. I'll likely spend some more over the course of this year on building a ramp in front of the garage door, adding some gravel to surround the structure, maybe adding some uh, gutters, little odds and ends like that. It's also worth mentioning that some of the doors and windows I purchased were used off Facebook Marketplace, so I saved a lot of money by doing it that way. So the total ended up being about $21,000. And the cost which isn't captured here is that I sacrificed almost all of my non-working and non-sleeping hours for this for about five months. And as we get deeper into this video, I'll show you what that looks like. An important consideration here is how much space you have on your property for the pallets which come with this garage kit. The kit alone consists of three pallets, uh, which you can see here in the bill of materials on the last few pages of the assembly guide. One of these pallets is delivered from a local supplier, not the makers of the West Virginia garage kit. In my case, this was Home Depot. Uh, be prepared to take inventory as soon as you receive all of this, uh, as my shipment was missing all 20 pieces of LP primed siding, and it took me a couple of weeks to get the issue resolved. Another consideration is weather. I had to keep all of my pallets covered most of the time because it just happened to be one of the rainiest summers on record in my region while I was building. 
And there's also a lot of stacking and unstacking, especially when I had to access materials which are at the bottom of a stack. Now, now, let's get into the foundation. Like I mentioned earlier, the kit from Best Barns gives you some flexibility when it comes to the foundation, and I chose concrete. Specifically, I went with the frost protected shallow foundation using the design guide on screen right now. Now, you don't have to go through all of this design effort I'm about to show you because you can probably just ask a contractor to make a slab foundation for a garage and they'll know what you mean and give you what you need. But I wanted to know exactly what I was going to get and I wanted to know the theory behind how it was going to be made. So I used this design guide and went through the steps that I'm about to show you. If you want to create a foundation design of your own, simply find the type of foundation you want in this guide and fill out the numbers using the guide and the reference material for climate and frost depth, and you'll get your basic design parameters. I went with the design for unheated spaces, but there are several design variations in this guide which you can use for different types of buildings or situations. From there, I plugged in all of the numbers and modeled the foundation in SolidWorks. Here, you can easily see the shape of the concrete and the layers of materials used. The base layer is a 6 inch sheet of compacted gravel, followed by a layer of R10 foam insulation. This layer extends into an underground skirt surrounding the foundation. Next is another layer of compacted gravel and then the concrete is formed and poured on top. Note that I did not include rebar or mesh in this model and I left their specifications up to the contractor. But these are critical components which should definitely not be left out. The foundation's top surface sits 4 inches above grade, with the bottom of the concrete being about a foot deep. Notice this small hole I included for future use. If I decide to add plumbing or some sort of geothermal setup for the loft in the future, I'll be glad I included this. Some people I talked to found this insulation underneath the foundation to be a bit weird, so let me explain. If you live somewhere with cold winters, the ground will freeze to a certain depth during part of the year. The depth to which it freezes is called the frost line. The ground below this line doesn't freeze because there's enough geothermal heat to keep the water in the soil from freezing. Slab foundations tend to be pretty shallow, so the ground underneath can freeze. Freezing makes water expand and the ground underneath the foundation will expand unevenly, causing the concrete to crack. The solution is to place insulation underneath the foundation. This will raise the frost line directly underneath because the insulating material traps a bit of the geothermal heat underneath. Now, back to the foundation design. After I was satisfied with the design, I created an engineering drawing and sent it out to some contractors to bid on the work. Note the 3000 PSI spec for the concrete. I actually instead ended up going with 5000. I also left a lot of the details up to the contractor, such as rebar, concrete anchors, the insulation, and the vapor barrier. Something that came in really handy was the ability of SolidWorks to estimate the volume of gravel and concrete I would need. My contractor commented that these quantities were pretty spot on. Later, I also created this document to show the contractor where to install J-bolt cast-in-place concrete anchors. These anchors are cast into the concrete and are used to hold down the frame of the building, and the amount I specified was definitely a bit overkill. Now, let's get into steps 1 and 2 from the building instructions, which are to build the stud walls for the back wall and the rear half of the side walls. These steps are pretty simple, just add markings to the specified 2x4s as shown and assemble accordingly. Make sure you use the pressure treated wood for the bottom of the stud walls where the wall makes contact with the foundation. My foundation uses concrete anchors, which are not mentioned in the instructions. So I had an extra step here where clearance holes for the concrete anchors had to be located, marked, and drilled. Then the studs could finally be screwed together. The instructions called for nails, but we went with screws here. I've heard mixed opinions on whether or not this was the right choice, so I guess we're just going to have to wait and see what happens. Unfortunately, a lot of the studs were warped on arrival. 
I got to work fairly quickly to make sure they didn't have enough time to warp, but that didn't seem to be enough. To be honest, the studs supplied by Home Depot were of very poor quality. Here's how we were able to somewhat alleviate this warping. I had a friend use a clamp to twist the stud into shape. Then I locked the stud in place with two screws. This does leave some residual stress in the wood, but again, we're just going to have to wait and see what happens. I then applied a layer of flex seal to the bottom of the stud walls over the pressure treated lumber. My thought is that this should seal out any moisture and present a tougher obstacle for termites or carpenter ants. Again, time will tell whether or not this was a good idea. Steps 3 and 5 are for assembling the front wall. I'm skipping over step 4 because it's mainly a repeat of other steps. The instructions here don't always give you exact dimensions because it's expected that you source your own garage door and window for the front. So, to make this easier for myself, I modeled the front wall in SolidWorks and used the cutout dimensions specified for the garage door and the window I picked out. This let me build a list of lumber cuts I needed to make, which let me easily pre-cut all of the parts and then assemble. For step 3 specifically, you have to assemble the garage door header, which is basically a stack of lumber and OSB, or plywood, glued and nailed together. This kit comes with a lot of glue, and trust me, we had to use all of it. The nails for this part and many other parts of this assembly have a specified nail pattern. We were careful to follow these patterns because they are likely specified for load bearing reasons. We also made sure that the stack was tightly held together until the glue set. Then I screwed all the pieces together and voila, I had a complete front stud wall. One of the side walls was similarly built because it had to accommodate the French door on the side. Here I had to source my own lumber for the doorway header because the garage kit does not anticipate such a wide door on this side and you need the thick lumber and extra studs to support the load from the joists and the roof arches. Finally, at step 6, we can see the building start to take shape. Here, we attach the stud walls to the foundation. Note that the instructions show angled supports to keep the walls straight and plumb. My first big regret in building this garage is not doing this, as one of my stud walls is leaning a couple of degrees because I did not properly support it during this step. But other than that, this was fairly easy and satisfying because everything lined up very nicely. During step 7, it's time to install the tie plates. Pay special attention to which ends of these 2x4s are supposed to be flush with the walls. You may need to trim some length off of these tie plates as I had a couple which were just a hair too long. Installing the LP siding in steps 8A and 8B is pretty self-explanatory. I happened to be in a rush while doing this and didn't record the process, but honestly there's nothing complicated about it. Just measure twice, cut once, and make sure everything is nice and plumb. We painted our siding right away to make sure it wouldn't be ruined by the rain. We also sealed whatever gap we had between the foundation and the siding with generous amounts of outdoor rated caulking. Now, let's proceed to the stair kit instructions. This document is separate from the main building guide for the garage and is fairly short and to the point, focusing only on the stairs and the floor of the loft. I'm going to go through this part pretty quickly. For step 1, find the stringers with 6 steps. Count them out to be sure there's actually 6 here because there's also a set with less steps included. Also pay close attention to how these 2 by 6 inch boards are oriented relative to the stringers and make sure that the bottom one is pressure treated. The bottom of the stringer looks like this and is slightly less tall than the rest of the steps. Mine was about six and a half inches tall. Use the 32 and a half inch long boards here. There are boards with similar lengths in the kit, so be careful not to mix them up. Finally, when screwing these parts together, I recommend actually pre-drilling holes for each of your screws. These pieces of wood will fit together really nicely and you don't need to worry about fixturing or modifying any of the parts. Repeat these steps for the upper, shorter set of stairs. This will be virtually identical to creating the lower set of stairs except the pressure treated lumber is not used here. 
Step two of the stair kit instructions goes over how to assemble the stair landing, which goes about midway up towards the loft. Again, these pieces fit together really nicely because high quality lumber is used. Make sure to use the 2 by 12 by 48 inch non-pressure treated board here because there are similar looking boards in the kit which are easy to mix up. We went the extra mile here and painted the stairs and stair landing before assembling it all in steps 3 and 4. Painting the slumber after the stairs were complete would have been much harder, so we decided to do this while everything was apart. Now I'm going to gloss over steps 3 and 4 because unfortunately I didn't record footage of these steps. But you've made it this far in the build process so these steps shouldn't be too difficult for you. Something to be aware of is that the bottom white pine riser in step 3 will be too tall and you'll have to cut a sliver of it off. I did this very easily with the help of a chalk line. You also need to anchor the bottom of the stairs and the stair walls to the foundation. I used 3 16 inch concrete anchors from Tapcon, which required a 5 32 inch masonry bit for my drill. I recommend using a drill with an impact function for this and expect to get about three holes out of each masonry bit before the bits are toast. Here's what the stairs look like when complete. The pine risers and treads had this gorgeous wood grain, so we decided to stain them to preserve that look. Now I went ahead and skipped to step 9 to finish up the stud walls before proceeding with the joist headers. I may have saved some time by doing this, but I still recommend following the instructions in order instead of following my lead. The reason the instructions have these steps in this particular order is so you can connect this stud wall to one of the joists for stability. I was actually still able to do this using the joist header added in step 10, so all in all, not a big deal. Up next, we're going back to step 5, which focuses on mounting the 2x10 joist headers to the walls. Pay special attention to the type of nails used in this step and be sure to follow the pattern outlined in the instructions. These nails will be taking a lot of shear force once the loft and the roof are up. Mounting these headers is pretty straightforward. Just clamp them in place and make sure they are level. Then screw them in place to keep them from shifting. Finally, nail them in using the pattern outlined in the instructions. Because I already finished step 10, I also added these headers in addition to the ones I needed to add for step 5. Step 6 is an easy one. Just mount these joist hangers directly above each stud wall. Be sure to use those fat 1.5 inch hanger nails. Step 7 goes over installing the main floor joists. This step tells you to secure the joists into the hangers with those same 1.5 inch hanger nails, but beware. In my municipality, these were too short to be up to code, so I have to replace them with 2 inch or longer hanger nails. Also, the instructions tell you to cut the joists to a length of 182 inches. Verify that this length is correct because if you mistakenly cut them too short, you've just wasted an entire joist. It was during this step that we noticed that the walls were bowed out slightly, and we confirmed this with a level and a plumb bob. You can see this here, where the walls are noticeably angled away from the end faces of the joints. Our solution was to first squeeze the walls together with a ratchet strap. Alright, go for it. Ooh, you got it. Yeah, I mean, go a little bit more, but yeah. Then, Chase rigged up some wire rope to keep the walls squeezed together permanently.
Step 8 is next, which involves installing the 3 4 inch loft flooring atop the joists. Because I skipped ahead on a few earlier steps, I was able to install all of these at once. I had a few pieces of flooring not line up properly with the joists, and in these scenarios I had to screw extra 2x4s to the joists to support the flooring from underneath. The rest of the steps in the stair kit instructions are all things I already finished because I skipped ahead. Before proceeding, I decided to take some time to apply a layer of flex seal to the bottom of the LP siding, just to be extra sure it was sealed to the foundation. And now we're done with the stair kit instructions, and we can go back to the general garage kit instructions. We're moving to step 13A, which is to put together the rear gable for the back wall. I kept rearranging these beams until I got close to these 188.5 and 297.5 inch lengths, but I couldn't hit the 188.5 inch length exactly. I did consider this close enough, and I screwed some scrap pieces of wood around the outside gable into the floor like so. These are here to let me copy this gable pattern for the next steps. For step 13b, I added the filler material and gussets. Make sure the gussets are used correctly, as the gussets on the side are not shaped the same way as the gussets at the top. Also, keep in mind that the gussets used here are a lot smaller than the ones used later on for the rest of the roof gables. I nailed these gussets and fillers in place and finished the rest of the gable wall. All of these parts, from the fillers and gussets to the studs with the angled cuts, are all pre-cut and included in one of the pallets supplied with the kit. Step 14 finishes off the rear gable wall by adding the LP siding. The two pieces of siding in the middle have to be cut to shape, but the two on the outside should arrive pre-cut. My kit did not come with enough of these pre-cut pieces, and I had to make two out of the four of these myself. Using a chalk line makes cutting these pieces much easier. Keep in mind that a 3 quarters inch overhang is needed here, and that the corners here are not fully covered. Step 15 was a bit of a departure from what I was working on, but it is necessary. That 3 quarters inch overhang on the siding on the gable wall will overlap the trim pieces, so the trim needs to be installed first. Don't forget to include the siding filler here. The kit comes with some skinny strips of siding material, and they're supposed to go here. My wife went ahead and painted these pieces before I installed the siding. Then I screwed them on and cut the additional length off of the side pieces. Step 16 had two parts. Add bracing to the back wall of the garage and erect the rear gable wall. The vertical bracing has to be installed on 2x4 blocks to give the siding on the gable wall enough clearance to cover the trim pieces. I omitted these long diagonal supports which are staked into the ground and still found the wall to be relatively stable during this step, especially with the diagonal support behind the wall. I then shimmied the wall side to side a little bit until I got about one and a half inches of overhang on either side. For step 17, I built the front gable wall. So basically just repeat steps 14, 15, and 16. I saved the window framing and cut out for later. Step 18 goes over the installation of the truss plates. This is another critical step. Pay special attention to this detail view, to the nail pattern need to add, and to the locations of where the X marks need to be drawn. The truss plates will be taking the load from the roof trusses, so getting this step right is important. Here's what the truss plates look like after they've been installed. Next, I installed the soffit blocks according to step 19. 
For this step, I needed 1x3 stripping, but I had to buy some of my own because some of the 1x3s which were included on the pallet from the local supplier were completely unusable. For now, these soffit blocks felt a little bit loose because I only installed them from the top of the truss blades. The double blocks on each corner were a bit tricky as the screw had to go in diagonally. Step 20 is where things started to get a bit more interesting. Remember those 2x4s I screwed into the floor during step 13? Those come into play here because they let me copy the shape of the gable walls for all of the roof trusses. This repeatability is critical if you want to achieve a nice, uniform looking roof. The first part of this step mentions finding the blue mark on top of the 2x6 boards. The faces with the blue marks are the ones which meet at the tip or the ridge of the roof truss. The knee gussets are asymmetrical, so I made sure to double check which side was the short side before installing. The short side is meant to be facing towards the ridge. The ridge gusset is easy to identify because it's symmetrical and visibly longer. I glued and nailed the gussets on top to lock in the shape of the truss, and then I slid the remaining gussets underneath with glue. Once the glue was dry, I went ahead and installed the trusses according to step 21. First, I put the 2x6 hangers in place on the truss plates, but only with a single nail, so they could still pivot. Then, I slid the truss in place and nailed the hangers down. This 2x4 board is critical, and I had this support running continuously down the length of the garage to add some extra support for the front and the rear gable walls and trusses. Here's what the build looked like after this step was complete. At this point, I had to put a pause on building for a few days because there was some rain incoming, so I covered the whole thing with tarps. I skipped step 22 and went straight into building the soffits for the front and rear gable walls as shown in step 23. At this stage in the build, all I wanted was to just have a complete roof to keep the rain out, because then I could finally take a nice real break. This step was easy. I just screwed the pre-cut 2x4s in place and added the pre-cut soffit panels. My kit actually did not have enough of these pre-cut panels for both the front and rear soffits, but I had enough scrap pieces of LP siding left over to cut my own soffit panels and make up the difference. I ended up with some gaps, which I filled with outdoor rated caulking just to keep the wasps and other insects from being able to crawl inside. The next step was to install the roof sheathing. This step has a few important considerations. The roof sheathing panels have to be plumb with the soffit panels, and the sheathing rows have to be installed in the order shown here. Scaffolding was absolutely necessary for this step, so I rented a set from Home Depot. I actually used indoor rated scaffolding because of availability, and just covered it with large tarps when it rained and made sure there were wooden boards underneath the wheels when using the scaffolding off pavement. The bottom rows of sheathing were used to reinforce those soffit blocks from step 19. To add the screws for the last top layer of sheathing, I actually had to climb up on top of the roof. This was not fun, but at least the sheathing was rough enough to give me some secure footing. Unfortunately, one of these boards ended up not being plumb with the soffit, so I had to do some trimming. Again, chalk line was a lifesaver here. Okay, now we're at step 25, which goes over how to install the front and rear gable trim pieces. This was not a difficult step, as I just had to put some 2x4s between the soffit panels and the overhanging part of the roof sheathing. Then, I screwed the trim pieces in. My wife again was kind enough to paint the trim pieces before installation. Next, I returned to step 22, which was installing the soffit panels on the side. Now, we departed from the building instructions and began focusing on the roofing. The first step was to install the underlayment. The type of underlayment you choose will likely depend on the type of roof you add to your garage. I chose the Owens Corning Pro Armor variety, 
which was a nice choice because it has a nice grippy texture which makes walking or crawling on the roof a bit less daunting. I pre-cut several lengths of it and my friend Chase stapled it all to the roof. Just as an aside, there are plenty of excellent tutorials out there on YouTube for how to install roofing. So definitely don't use my video as an instructional guide. I don't know what I'm doing. Then I pre-cut all of the roofing panels with a pair of shears to the desired length to ensure a few inches of overhang for each, but not too much. This was really difficult and some kind of power tool would have made this a lot easier. I also made the mistake of handling some of these panels barehanded and the sharp metal edges bloodied my hands pretty severely. I screwed the panels to the roof, careful to keep them nice and plumb. The grippy texture of the underlayment helped here as well since it made the panels less likely to slide. Here I'm installing some foam weather stripping to seal out moisture from this corner. I installed this flashing on top of that. This was probably not the right item for the job since metal roofs typically have special eave flashing. But hey, it's been a few months and I've had plenty of snow, rain, and wind since this, and this has kept all of it out. I then added the same foam weather stripping on top of the flashing and placed the next row of roofing panels on top of that. Remember how I mentioned that I couldn't find the rake trim with the right color, so I just bought some from a different color and painted over it? Here's what that looked like. I used the can of primer and red enamel and it came out pretty nice. Maybe I'll post a follow-up video in a few years showing how well this paint job held up. I laid down some butyl weather stripping and screwed the rake trim in place. With that out of the way, Chase, who just happens to be an animal, climbed up on top of the roof again and screwed the ridge vent on top to finally seal out the rest of the roof. Next, I added some reinforcement lengthwise on either side of the roof in preparation for installing the greenhouse window. I found this thing on Facebook Marketplace for 150 bucks, and it weighs a ton. Because of its design, it has to be installed from the outside, which meant that we had to improvise and make a pulley system to hoist it up. Unfortunately, I didn't record much of this as this project was really starting to sap my energy at this point. 